Our two presenters are David Morrow and Celine Kermish. Uh, David will be presenting first, so why don't we uh, proceed? Thank you very much. Uh, about a month ago, in fact, a month ago yesterday, a number of, a uh, small number of prominent British scientists uh, came before the House of Commons to warn them about imminent ecological uh, or environmental collapse in the Arctic. And they said, we need to start doing something about this by next spring. And what they wanted to start doing about it, is this not? Uh, I can switch to podium. So there are these British scientists, and they're at the House of Commons. Right? And uh, what they want to start doing about cooling the Arctic is they want to start uh, some combination of injecting uh, particles into the stratosphere, spraying seawater uh, into the lower atmosphere to brighten clouds, and reducing uh, black carbon deposits in the Arctic to reflect more sunlight back into space to lower the temperature in the Arctic. My impression, and I am not a climate scientist, is that most climate scientists think that these are rather alarmist concerns. And that though the long-term picture is uh, as dire as they say, uh, this is not something we need to start doing right away. But this basic idea of reflecting sunlight back into space as a means of counteracting increased greenhouse gas concentrations has in the last 10 years gone from sort of the lunatic fringe and the realm of science fiction to something that scientists and engineers and policymakers are beginning to take really seriously. And it's uh, an idea called solar radiation management. Although I'm told this was actually a uh, spoof term created by one of the people who came up with the idea or is, is studying the idea uh, as what the government will probably call it once they want to start doing it. Right? And it's the term that's stuck. So we're stuck with the idea of solar radiation management. I should preface the whole talk by saying that no one who is working seriously on any aspect of solar radiation management uh, thinks that this is a substitute for other measures to address climate change. Right? It's sometimes presented that way in the media. No one who is working on it seriously thinks it's a substitute. It is at best a complement to adaptation and mitigation measures. Uh, a lot of people think it's more like an emergency backstop that we might need. But they think we might need it and so they want to start doing the research. The reason I'm worried about this is because even doing the research is ethically problematic. So I want to do three things in this talk. I want to uh, explain why even doing the research is ethically problematic. I want to sketch a uh, proposal for the global governance of solar radiation management research, SRM research. And I want to raise some philosophical questions about that governance, uh, including questions about the proper relationships among science, policy, and values. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about what the options are. Right? How are we actually going to pull off solar radiation management if we ever decide to do it? Well, in the uh, lower right here, you have the sort of low leverage uh, techniques that involve changing the Earth's albedo, right? its reflectiveness. So you have everything from uh, putting roofs on buildings that reflect more light right? to uh, changing land cover usage, even genetically modifying crops so that they reflect more light, to taking areas like deserts uh, that Cacti are there just to show you it's a desert, I think, and adding mirrors to make it more reflective. 
On the left side and up above, you have the higher leverage, higher risk, uh, sexier, scarier ideas. So here you have uh, an illustration of a ship that would be injecting very, si very fine particles of seawater into the lower atmosphere to brighten marine cloud cover to reflect more sunlight out. Uh, above that, uh, up in the stratosphere, you have uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, which is the most frequently talked about form of SRM. Uh, and it's using some kind of mechanism from a weather balloon in this case to uh, specially designed airplanes to uh, uh, naval guns, just firing aerosols into the stratosphere. And then the most science fiction-y idea is to actually build an array of mirrors in space in between the Earth and the Sun. Right? Uh, I don't know that anyone's pursuing that one very seriously, but it always gets added to these illustrations because it's kind of the most fun. Right? Um, okay. So these are uh, the things we're thinking about. The one I'm going to focus most uh, specifically on is the stratospheric aerosol injection because it's the one that I think people are pursuing most seriously. Okay, so why is this ethically problematic? Well, uh, I'm gonna give three arguments for this. First one I'm gonna call the human subjects research argument. We know in principle that injecting particles into the stratosphere will lower the global temperature. Right. Particularly large volcanic eruptions have done this noticeably. So Pinatubo in the early 90s lowered global average temperatures by about half a degree Celsius. Uh, earlier larger eruptions probably lowered it more, but no one was measuring that closely. So we know this works in principle, but while we know there are risks, while we know that a high greenhouse gas uh, planet with lots of stratospheric aerosols is cooler than one without. It's not the same planet. It's not the same climate. Precipitation in particular changes. Uh, the changes in temperature are not even across the world. And so you, we'd have to figure out what the risks are. Unfortunately, the only way to figure that out is to do it. You don't have to do it at full scale, but you have to do it uh, at an intensity and for a duration where you can detect the signal against the background noise of climatic variation. And we're talking about a 20-year experiment that lowers global average temperature for uh, by you know, half a degree or a degree. And if the Indian Ocean monsoon half shuts down for a year, maybe that's because of this, maybe not. We have to keep trying and see. And that's one of the more uh, dramatic concerns people raise. Uh, it's unlikely it would really shut down, but it could seriously diminish precipitation from the Indian Ocean monsoon. And that feeds the agriculture that feeds hundreds of millions of people. So if we're going to do that kind of global trial of SRM, we are essentially making every single person, animal, and ecosystem the subject of scientific experiment. And when you think about the things that you're not allowed to do to people without informed consent in the course of scientific research, this seems like it should be pretty high on the list, right, of things you're not allowed to do. So it's ethically problematic, right, to say the least. The next two arguments I want to talk about are quite different. Because this argument applies only to global field trials. The next two apply to just about anything. The first one is usually called the moral hazard argument. Moral hazard is a term used especially in uh, insurance to refer to risks that people will take when they know they are insured against uh, the downside risk. So this skier who is going down a ski slope that is apparently called idiot's delight right, probably would not do this unless he or she knew right, that there would be medical help if needed. The concern about SRM is that if we start doing the research on SRM, some people will see this as an alternative to real climate change measures or take advantage of it to create the perception that it's an alternative. And it will actually diminish the political will 
to take adaptation and mitigation seriously. And we don't have enough of that political will as it is, so diminishing it further might be quite problematic. Third argument, same illustration, uh, is often called the slippery slope argument. So we have some reasons to think that the technology could be problematic if it were ever deployed or even tested at scale. And the worry is that once you start doing the research seriously, you're going to have people who want to keep doing it until they find out whether they can do it, until they've developed the technology. And the technology is expected to be cheap. Right? Cheap enough that a small country or a large firm or even an extremely wealthy individual could finance it. So once you've invented the technology, it can't be uninvented. And the worry is that someone will want to use it, even if the rest of us decide it's a bad idea. So merely uh, starting the research might lead to the point where SRM will be used, even when the rest of us don't want that to happen. So these are the three arguments to think that SRM research is ethically problematic. And I've divided them left and right for a clear reason. Uh, the human subjects research argument applies only to global field trials. The other two apply to all research. And it's those last two the arguments that relate to all of the research that I'm most interested in today. So let's talk about this proposal uh, for regulating the research. This is based on um, a proposal that I presented at the American Geophysical Union meeting in uh, December. Uh, this, like all the other work I've done on this, has been co-authored with some climate scientists, uh, Bob Kopp at Rutgers and Michael Oppenheimer at Princeton. Uh, I should point out at this stage that they are at best ambivalent about this proposal. So um, don't pin this on them. The proposal involves three institutions. The first is uh, what I'm going to call an SRM test ban treaty, which is a multilateral treaty, something like a disarmament treaty, uh, most closely resembling the nuclear threshold test ban treaty which is just an agreement among sovereign states that they will all forswear SRM tests above a certain threshold. So basically, they will all agree not to do the kinds of global field trials that we are worried about in the human subjects research argument. One concern about this is that in order to make it politically palatable and meaningful, you might need an escape valve, as it were. Uh, in case some powerful country decides 20, 50 years from now that they want out, right? that they really do need to start doing these tests. So the proposal for dealing with this right, is what I'm calling an SRM Research Oversight Council, right? an international body that would presumably be created by the test ban treaty, and it would have the authority uh, not to conduct the studies itself, but to authorize others to conduct global field trials of SRM, trials that would otherwise be banned by the Test Ban Treaty. Uh, this raises some really difficult questions about global political legitimacy. Right? Who could possibly have the authority to authorize these things? Um, we can talk, if you like, about uh, what this should look like. but. Bob and Michael and I have already kind of written that paper. So uh, I'm less interested in that topic right now. I'll just say as a sort of teaser that I think the council could consist of fewer countries than you think. Uh, one of the proposals on the table is a committee of one to two dozen countries, most of them uh, fairly powerful, right? and some kind of global consultative process that they would have to go through. The third institution, though, is the one I really want to talk about, because it's the one that deals with the research below the level of a global field trial. And I'm calling this uh, a climate engineering research program, an international uh, organization that would serve essentially to coordinate climate engineering research, geoengineering research, the broader term for, or that includes solar radiation management. 
And this could be organized either as a program of or a cross-cutting initiative of existing scientific organizations like the World Climate Research Program. Right? These are very loose organizations. They serve to sort of coordinate funding sources and international projects. The projects are all actually run by uh, individual teams of scientists. When I suggest something like this to the engineers and scientists who are doing this kind of research already, they like the idea of the international program, right? That sounds good to them. And then I say, and maybe it should have some kind of ethical oversight of your research. And they say, well, maybe it's not such a good idea. They don't, they don't like this part. They're climate scientists. They're not really used to having to think about these sorts of things. But there are a few uh, questions that I want to ask about whether such a program could or should regulate research below the level of a global field trial. Right. So that brings us to uh, the third and therefore final of my trios here, these three questions that I want to ask about the climate engineering research program and how its kind of governance of uh, the early stage research might work. So the first question is, when may society restrict R&D, not deployment or use, but just research and development into a technology that's expected to be ethically problematic? And one of the variables here is, well, what do you mean by expected to be ethically problematic? How much confidence do you need? Uh, and what are you talking about when you say a technology is ethically problematic? Right, the engineers who want to work on this stuff say, well, the technology is just neutral. It's just the way people use it. And I think when you're thinking about policy, that's the wrong way to think about technology uh, because creating new technologies will alter uh, the options that people have and the costs of pursuing those different options and thus the incentives they face to make one choice rather than another. And so given that on a large scale, you can, I think, effectively predict the way people will behave by looking at the incentives they face. Right? Changing their incentives by giving them this new cheap option that looks like an alternative to doing something about climate change creates a reasonable risk that someone will deploy it, even if it's a bad idea for lots of other people. That is, even if it creates really serious risks for lots of other people. Thanks. And given that we can reasonably foresee that if the technology were available, it would raise serious ethical problems, uh, I think we can at least legitimately ask ourselves whether society could restrict research and development. Second one is uh, the one that I've gotten the most pushback on from engineers. I've suggested that the Climate Engineering Research Program might have something like an IRB, right? something where if you wanted to do some research in climate engineering, you would go to you know, this board at the research program and say, here's what I want to do. And they would either uh, approve or deny or require modifications in the way that an IRB does for human subjects research. Some of the pushback is, well, I don't like that. Right? Some of it is, uh, you're giving people power to squash research. The second one of those is at least, uh, I think, important. But there's a, a deeper argument here, which goes something like this. Either all of the research is ethically problematic because of the moral hazard argument and the slippery slope argument, in which case uh, the IRB isn't going to approve anything, and so you shouldn't even have the research program. Or if the slippery slope argument and the moral hazard argument don't show that all the research is problematic, it's unclear what of any of this research would be ethically problematic until you get to the stage of the global field trial. And that's already dealt with through the other institutions, right? the uh, Test Ban Treaty Research Oversight Council. And so you wouldn't need an IRB. And so there's an argument there that suggests that uh, the IRB serves absolutely no purpose. 
So one question I have about this, and one thing I'd be particularly interested in feedback on, is uh, if there were something like an IRB, what kinds of studies, if any, might it prohibit? Or what other role might it have uh, in regulating research below the level of a global field trial? Finally, well, I think this is more for sort of historians or sociologists of uh, science and technology. Is it realistic to expect that global society could prohibit the development of SRM technology? In other words, if we set up all these institutions and some people are, as it were, playing by the rules uh, under this governance, are we essentially just forcing the people who don't want to play by the rules to do it somewhere else? In which case, the technology still gets invented. Uh, in which case all the moral hazard, slippery slope stuff doesn't matter, or at least the precautions that we're taking against it uh, don't matter. Um, I have some views about some of these, right? So I, I think the answer to the first question is yes, for the reasons I gave. I have no idea what to say about the second one. Uh, I'm tempted to say about the third, there's a real chance that we can't prevent it, but I'm not sure that means that we shouldn't try. Uh, but what I most need your help with, since I'm really, at the end, an ethical theory guy, not a research ethics, bioethics, environmental ethics, science studies guy, is what to do about governance of uh, climate engineering research below the level of a global field trial. Thanks. Thank you. Well, the title of my talk is Ethics in Nanotechnology Policies. And in fact, I got interested in this question because currently we are facing an extremely rapid development of these technologies. Indeed, in the year 2000, President Clinton, who was at that time counseled by Mikhail Rocco from the NSF, launched the NNI program, which is the National Nanotechnology Initiative which is really at the origin of the boom of nanotechnologies with huge investments at stake. Uh, the United States have invested approximately 14 billion of dollars since the launch of the program in 2000. The report issued, the NNI report issued in 2000 does specify a specific moment of intervention for, for ethics which is in fact a crucial point insofar as nanotechnologies do come along with important ethical issues. What I would like to ask here is if this ethical framing and its timing are appropriate. My talk will be structured in three parts. First, I will show at which stage the NNI report recommends ethical reflection. Then I will show that generation one nanotechnologies, these are very simple nanotechnologies, do come along with important ethical issues. And finally, I will proceed to the discussion where I will ask the question, um, is the moment of intervention of ethics proposed by the NNI report adequate? So let us first examine what we are talking about when we talk about nanotechnologies and at which stage the NNI report does recommend inter, uh, ethical Reflection, sorry. So according to the British Royal Society, nanotechnologies are defined as a design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling shape and size at nanometer scale. So the term nanotechnologies includes just a very wide range of potential applications. It goes from food to chemicals to personal care products, medical devices, military applications as well. And we can say that nanotechnology is defined as such, designates both relatively simple, as we may say, 
nanomaterials such as, uh, for example, stain-resistant cotton fabrics or improved cosmetics. And on the other hand, they designate also uh, very complex and even hypothetic technologies that are supposed to redefine the future of humankind. And I'm here thinking of uh, brain implants that could enhance human capacities, for example. So in order to specify uh, the different types of applications that are at stake, I would like to introduce now the classical typology that has been developed by Mikhail Rocco, which is based on the idea of generations of nanotechnologies, generations which are progressively introduced over time. And uh, according to Rocco, there are four overlapping generations. Generation one, corresponding to passive nanostructures. Passive because the behavior of these structures is supposed to be steady over time. Uh, it is, for example, when we add a nanomaterial to another material in order to improve its performances. Typically, when we add nanoparticle to a sunscreen in order uh, to have a cream that doesn't leave a white film on the face. And in fact, we could say that most of the current applications of nanotechnologies do belong to this first generation. Generation two are corresponding to active nanostructures. Active because their behavior is supposed to evolve according to their environment. So these technologies are just able to perform functions such as targeting drugs to specific parts of the body. And the new targeted cancer therapies do belong to this second generation of nanotechnologies. Generation three are integrated nanosystems, so systems of nanosystems. These could be, uh, for example, artificial organs which would be built from the nanoscale, and these are supposed to emerge from now on, according to Rocco. And finally, we have the fourth generation of nanotechnologies, which is, which is anticipated to be heterogeneous molecular nanosystems, such as human-machine interfaces at the tissue level and at the nervous system level. Um, so, and according to Rocco, these are supposed to arise from 2015, 2020. Let us see now at which stage uh, ethical reflection is supposed to be conducted according to the NNI report. Well, first we have to mention that the policies expressed in this report do emphasize, and it's a very good thing and very rare thing, uh, the necessity to proceed to, I quote, focused research on societal implications of nanotechnology, including social, ethical, legal, economic, and workforce implications. However, the same report promotes, in fact, ethical reflection only for sophisticated, radically new applications. So that would be the third and mainly the fourth generation of nanotechnologies. And more recently, the same kind of has been advocated by the International Risk Governance Council in its, in its white paper on nanotechnology risk governance, which is even more explicit because it says that ethical issues are only at stake from the second generation, whereas more basic uh, nanotechnologies merely pose technical difficulties. So let me now move to the second part of my talk where I will show that there are fundamental, fundamental sorry, ethical issues at stake at every stage of nanotechnological development, so also for generation one. These ethical issues are mainly associated with the important uncertainties that are surrounding nanotechnologies, with the difficulties to define nanotechnologies properly, the threats of nanodivide, the fact that nanotechnology is a dual-use technology, and the question of the social desirability of nano. I'll begin with the ethical problems associated with the uncertainties surrounding nanotechnologies. And we can say, in fact, that with the first generation, we are facing safety issues, but also environmental risks and health risks. I don't have time to expand on that now, so let me briefly focus on health risks only. And in the field of health risks, there are many uh, uncertainties, and this for several reasons. First, uh, there are important measurement difficulties, like measurements are not widely available yet. 
Secondly, there are also uncertainties about how the, nano, how the nanomaterials can penetrate in the body and uh, through inhalation, ingestion, contact, and how they can accumulate in the body. The processes that are involved at these stages are very poorly understood at the moment. Moreover, it is not obvious how exposure relates to toxicity. It is unclear how the chemical composition, the size, the shape, the surface area, and many other characteristics do affect the toxicity of a nanomaterial. And whereas, with, um, whereas traditionally the chemical composition is sufficient to determine the toxicity of a substance, the, the problem is much more complex in the case of nanotechnologies. So we can see why all these problems lead us to say that the, we have a very poor understanding of health risks that are at stake. And in fact, strictly, strictly speaking, sorry, we should say that we are facing a situation of uncertainty rather, rather than a situation of risk. Under these conditions, we may of course ask if it is ethically justifiable to develop and to market such products, and how can we make sure that the principles of safety and sustainability are not jeopardized. There are many ethical issues that are at stake with the management of these uncertainties. Typically, um, the risk-cost-benefit analysis cannot be used uh, appropriately in this case because not only the risks are largely unknown, but also the benefits are difficult to assess. So we can see why all these uncertainties makes um, nanotechnologies an ideal candidate for requiring the precautionary principle. Well, I know it has some bad publicity in the United States comparing to Europe, but <laughs> I'm not advocating here a strong version of the precautionary principle some, such as a moratorium, but rather uh, the requirement of further research. However, as we will see now, there are some uh, difficulties to define nanotechnologies which hinder the possibility to uh, apply the precautionary principle. So the difficulty to define nanotechnologies in, is an important issue because it is at the origin of several uh, other ethical problems. So the question that arises is how to define nanos as substances that are different from, the, from their non-nano equivalent. Of course, intuitively, it's the size that comes to mind first, and usually we speak of nanotechnology when at least one dimension of the product is smaller than 100 nanometer. However, this 100 nanometer limit may seem somewhat arbitrary because it is not obvious that's one, that 100 nanometer is the typical size when the material's properties start changing. So relying on this yardstick does not allow to take into account neither particles with a, which, with a size sorry, slightly above, this is supposed to be an arrow, okay, <laughs> slightly above 100 nanometer, nor aggregates of nanoparticles which would also exceed 100 nanometers. Another problems come, problem comes from the fact that relying only on the particle size is insufficient as other physical features such as shape do drastically influence uh, the material properties. And in the same vein, the environment of the materials and the fact that they may be associated with other components play also an important role in defining their characteristics. So why is this difficulty to define nanotechnologies so problematic? It is the case because if we want to develop a specific uh, framework, regulatory framework for nanotechnologies, we need to be able to define their identity at, the, at the, the statutory and at the legal levels, which is currently impossible. Among the issues that are arising, of course, the labeling issues, e issue is at stake. How can we label uh, products containing nanoproducts when we are unable to define those? And this current impossibility hinders the um, possibility to ensure consumers' informed consent. In the same vein, how can we demand the application of the precautionary principle when we are unable to define the products that are at stake? 
Let me now move to another ethical issue, which is the threat of nano divides, so the threat that uh, nanotechnologies would increase the, defined, the divide sorry, between the north and the south. And this might happen in two, at least two respects. First, the fact that there are many applications that could particularly benefit developing countries. And I'm here thinking of um, technologies that will al allow water purification improvement or um, solar energy. And it is more than likely that uh, developed countries will have access to these technologies, whereas developing countries will not be able to afford those. Another point is that nanotechnologies could replace uh, materials, raw materials that are currently mined, mainly in developing countries, and thereby again increasing the divide. And it is, for example, the case in electronics where carbon nanotubes could replace metal conductors such as gold or silver. We, thus, we, we have thus here uh, important equity and distributive justice issues that are at stake with Generation 1. Another ethical issue comes from the fact that nanotechnologies have been, since the beginning, developed both for civilian and military purposes. They are thus a very good example of dual-use technology. And for example, if we look at the budget, the initial budget of the NNI, for 2001, the total budget was approximately 500 million of dollars, and among those, more than 100 million was dedicated to the Department of Def Defense. So, well, but of course, military secrecy makes it difficult to expand on ethical issues associated with uh, new mit military technologies, but I think it's necessary at least to mention those and the fact that they do concern all generations of nanotechnology, because it goes from toxic nanodust to enhanced battle jumpsuit or autonomous weapons, for example. Of course, some kinds of applications appear to be beneficial only, and I'm here thinking, for example, of nanosensors that could help to detect chemical or biological weapons. But on the other hand, other applications could also create new threats, which would be precisely difficult to detect. And in fact, to some extent, we could say that the use of first generation nanotechnologies, I'm here thinking of toxic nanodust, uh, reiterates the important ethical issues that were already at stake with biological and nuclear weapons that are, of course, the issues of control and proliferation. So the last ethical, important ethical issue I would like to address here is the question of the social desirability of uh, Generation 1 nanotechnologies. Well, it is often acknowledged that an upstream approach is only needed from Generation 2. It's the official position of the International Risk Governance Council, for example. But it seems to me that the question of the social desirability is all also legitimate for Generation 1, and all the issues I've mentioned before do contribute to the justification, to the justification sorry, of such a debate. And in fact, avoiding such a debate implicitly, implicitly leads to impose these technological developments which are not necessarily corresponding to social needs or public aspirations. Now, uh, as some of these nanoproducts are already on the market, the focus is only on their potential risks. However, framing the debate only in terms of risks and benefits is of course reductionist because uh, using risk-cost benefit risk analysis sorry, do allow to take into account the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence, but it neglects medium, many important other ethical principles, such as the principle of integrity, autonomy, or the principle of justice. So it seems to me that a pure consequentialist stance should be balanced with the ontological arguments based on the individual's rights and duties. Perfect. Um, so I'm moving to the last part of my talk, which is the discussion. And we have seen that the NNI report, as well as the I IRGC white paper, consider that ethical reflection has to be stimulated only for radically new generations, radically new applications of nanotechnology. 
Why is it the case? Well, it's probably the case, at least partly, because radically new applications of nanotechnology are associated with human enhancement in a transhumanist perspective. So let us uh, recall the main ethical or I would say more broadly philo philosophical issues that are at stake with human enhancement, very, very briefly. <laughs> First, the fact that they involve symbolic risks, symbolic risks which are threats to fundamental representations such as human nature, for example. Human en enhancement is also susceptible to raise important meta metaphysical issues uh, with the hybridization of the living and the lifeless. For example, um, borders, uh, no, not borders, yes, um, traditional borders such as nature and artifacts, or living and non-living, or human and non-human could, could be blurred. So we can, we can thus see why these issues may seem uh, more important. It's because they involve the notion of humankind itself. However, uh, we have seen that there are already many ethical issues at stake with Generation 1. So my conclusion here is that um, the moment of intervention of ethics promoted in these major science and ethics and technology policies is inappropriate and that um, ethics should be promoted since the early research and development stages. The focus on radically new applications does not have to serve as a pretext to evacuate ethical questioning of generation one nanotechnologies that are currently put on the market, there are already more than a thousand products on the market, without any ethical framing. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for questions, so why don't the uh, uh, two presenters come up to the front and, and we can Take questions. Who would like to start? I really enjoyed both your presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question, David, um, from yours. One, I guess, a, a question for clarification and then a comment. Um, who funds this research? Um, the research that's being done now? Yeah. Or, uh, so most of the research that's being done now is something like computer modeling. So some of it is you know, someone who uh, runs climate models anyway and gets funding from either their university or I don't know where to run climate models. We'll run a climate model with extra uh, aerosols in the stratosphere see what happens. Um, the two things that have really gone beyond that, or two proposals, involved an attempt last fall, um, an, an experiment full of symbolism to float a trial balloon to pump aerosols into the lower atmosphere. Um, was The funding was approved by the British government. Um, even though it was explicitly done as a step towards solar radiation management. Uh, but then they backed off in the face of strong opposition from certain groups. Um, some of the other research is just funded by people who are funding climate research. Because with a lot of the early research, it's impossible to tell the difference. So an experiment last year that received far less attention called E-Peace uh, involved a ship going back and forth over a small remote area of the Pacific with some planes and satellites watching the cloud cover above it. And, and it's basically an SRM experiment, but you're also learning all kinds of interesting things about cloud physics and all that. Um, so you can get funding for it just through you know, NSF or whoever is giving your climate science funding. I was just, I, the reason why I asked that question, I think it's relevant to considering what sort of mechanisms might be helpful um, for regulating, if at all, for, for having some sort of um, research ethics process. Um, initially, when you were talking, I was thinking the idea of a, you know, the idea is associated with clinical trials and the NIH, and so that rather than having research trial centers that are separate, actually 
having, so if that was, if there was actually some sort of vested industry support. It doesn't sound like that's the case yet. Although, right. and they may not be. They may actually, may actually have disincentives and maybe like vaccine research and that there's, you know, who's the market, who's going to buy this stuff. So it, it, it sounds like that's, um, I was, I was, I noted the absence of, of considering that in, in the structures, but I, I wonder if there are, if maybe even vaccine research or clinical trial might be an informative one important difference there, I think, is that um, for vaccine research, uh, the uh, person who gets the vaccine doesn't get all the benefits of being vaccinated, right? There are always positive externalities. There are positive externalities with SRM, but it's cheap enough that if Germany decides that it wants SRM, it can pay for it, and it just doesn't care about the benefits everyone else gets, right? It, that is, it's not doing it only because of those benefits. It might be worth it to a particular country to pay for it themselves. So the weird economic issues. Okay. I think you actually have a different unit of analysis with the nation at the state level. In some ways, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry I have to come in the middle hearing the other talk, but um, Celine, I didn't get to hear the very beginning of your talk, but I was curious. Um, so it looks like you're um, in uh, Brussels. Um, uh, are you familiar with the work that I think the European Commission has been doing with Renee von Schomburg on developing a sort of some sort of code for responsible research in nanotechnology? And I was curious what you thought about that as a way of bringing in some upstream reflection in terms of the research that might be being done right now. Just what are your thoughts on? How helpful that is, if at all, and what you think of that. Yes, indeed. Um, I am familiar with uh, René von Schomberg, who, who, come off, who comes often at our university to make talks. And well, there is much debate going on about this, I, this whole idea of responsible development because, um, and I could send, I could give you some good references about it, because. Some people argue that it's a new way to, how, um, when we say, to put it um, in another way, when we say precautionary principles, people say, oof, no, no <laughs> precautionary principle. Whereas when we say responsible innovation, we are still in a, in a development perspective. Whereas they are basically not exactly the same, but ideas which are very close in these two uh, ways of expressing it. So, okay, well, I think um, basically the idea is good, but I'm wondering if it's not, if there is not some hypocrisy be behind the, um, the idea of introducing these new terms in order to make it uh, um, accepted in the, mainly by the, the industry and the market. Any other questions? Yes, so, so the second talk about the the sort of uh, the, the issue of uh, weapons of mass destruction development. And I'm wondering what that can actually bring to the bring to the geoengineering question. So, what can we learn about the regulation of nuclear weapons proliferation, or about uh, what can we learn from the case of um, the hypothetical ability to weaponize? Uh, sorry. sorry, hypothetical ability to weaponize um, uh, pathogens and what, how that's actually played out. Um, it's one of those sort of rare cases where it makes me feel very optimistic that we were supposed to have had rogue states detonating nuclear weapons all over the place by now after the fall of Russia, the fall of the Soviet Union. And similarly, we were supposed to have had several plagues of weaponized Ebola by now. But that hasn't actually been played out. We had somebody send some weird stuff through the mail. And so, um, is that is there a sort of historical reason to be optimistic that we actually can either tacitly or sort of explicitly prevent this sort of irresponsible or sort of rogue research from happening in the case of geoengineering? It seems like we've actually been remarkably and surprisingly effective at stopping people from doing this sort of weaponizing with pathogens research, even though it's hypothetically cheap and it could be, could hypothetically benefit a wide variety of different countries who could, uh, could use it for their, their personal ends. 
Well, to be to be honest, I I don't know. In fact, uh, for the nuclear weapons, it seems to me that well, we don't know how it's going to happen in next in the next few years. But um, one point that has been uh, determining is that the fact that would some countries begin to use nuclear weapons well they know that everybody's going to get involved and themselves as well so this is a different point but well the reason is obvious here but for bi biochemical and nanotechnological uh, weapons to be honest I, I have i haven't been thinking about that um, yeah i was thinking more more, more so with the with the geoengineering that um, yeah. how would the sort of um, essentially the game theory that play out it seems like um, there's a lot of hesitance among individual actors to sort of step outside of step outside of the bounds. They they benefit from making threats or sort of like throwing out the idea that maybe they'll do some do some geoengineering or develop a nuclear weapon, but they don't actually go through with it because they have their repercussions for it. Uh huh. Um, I think the the nuclear weapons case is a clearer analogy, at least in the biological and chemical weapons. I'm not quite sure what to say about the fact that we haven't had weaponized Ebola or bird flu yet. We're getting closer to that one. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, my co-authors and I have looked at in thinking about the test ban treaty and that sort of thing is the nuclear uh, anti-proliferation regime. Um, I think some of the incentives are different. Uh, in particular, uh, it might climate change might get to a point where some country says, "Look, we need to do something. We need to do SRM, uh, or we're going to be in big, big trouble." And there is no alternative like conventional weapons at that point provides an alternative to nuclear weapons. And um, it's also less clear that. Uh, Japan starting SRM and picking them totally arbitrarily uh, would bring the equivalent of a nuclear strike against them. All right, so there's this very clear disincentive to be the one that use, uses nuclear weapons first. And the disincentive is at least not as strong to be the one who initiates unilateral SRM. But it's, I, I agree, it's an important and valuable analogy to look at. Just a question. Both of you had interesting talks, and it was like you know putting limits on things that scientists think that may be making the world better. And there's some issues. But looking at each other's talk, do you see anything like what she's doing that would impact what you're doing, and what you know he suggested that might help you? Did you learn anything from each other, or you know, is it do you, do you see commonalities between both your talks and, and learnings from them? Yes, the, the control structures that you were talking about would be something, I mean, we have something like that in the field of uh, nuclear with the I, um, yeah, I, A, E, I, sorry, I, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, but for the moment, we have nothing like that in the field of nanotechnologies. So clearly, that would be something very useful. And uh, uh, But basically, yes, it's the main issues that are addressed, how to control te technological development. And it's as you say, when you talk about an ethical, um, when you talk about inputting ethical issue, uh, eti ethical framing, most of the climate scientists said, oh, we're not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's the same kind of issues that arise with uh, nanotechnology research. There are completely, I mean, uh, I know some of the people who are working in the field of nanotechnology in my university, well, they are in their laboratory and they are absolutely unaware and uninterested in the ethical issues associated with, the, with their, develop, their developments. Yeah, I certainly saw a lot of commonalities. Um, in fact, at one point, Celine said something about not knowing, uh, not knowing the numbers you need to run the risk analysis because you don't know what the relevant probabilities are, you don't know what the relevant harms and benefits are. Uh, and that's actually how I got into doing this, that my co-authors were thinking, the people who are now my co-authors, were thinking about doing a risk analysis for geoengineering. And they said, well, 
the uh, potential harms are effectively infinite. We don't know what the benefits are, and we have no idea what the probabilities are. And one of them said, this sounds like a philosophy paper. Let's call David. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot in common, especially about the question of when the right point is in the development of that technology to start thinking about the ethics and the governance. Because at least in SRM, uh, even the scientists and engineers agree that when it comes to a global trial, uh, much less deploying the technology, the ethics and political questions have to be taken really, really seriously. Well, in fact, the question of SRM, I mean, it's again, I, 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 in, if I don't know how to, to, to make it, but uh, to, to, to put it, but um, it seems to me more that the, SM, the SRM issue might be uh, put at the same level that the question of human enhancement, because everything is at stake. And, well, my point here was to argue that even simpler nanotechnologies that are maybe not so revolutionary and the whole world is not maybe at stake, but those, those, those nanotechnologies, sorry, do deserve ethical att attention. But the SRM issue seems to me more like, um, well, the, the possibility of humankind is at stake, uh, at the limit, we would say. So. You, you be making an artifact out of the entire climate. Just one concern once people have about it. But as you said, once it's done, it's done, and maybe it can go worse. And, and we can find out. Yeah, why, or not. <laughs> I think we had it here. So um, I, I, I did a workshop once with some um, nanotechnology researchers and on nan nanoethics, and there was one there's one argument they actually seem to take seriously with them, um, and I'm wondering if you had any similar experiences. The one that, the one concern they actually took seriously, basically from the level one on, is their own safety. Yeah. And so they don't even have the slightest concept of what kind of respirators, what kind of gloves, what kind of test tubes even would actually protect them from harm. I mean, they, nobody wants to be the curies. I mean, they want to be in one sense, they want to be in the other sense. <laughs> and so they actually they actually gave them some pause, like, well. Is this the question? Is it toxic? They, they don't seem to care about the mascara that's being sold with the with these with this carbon in it. But when they're touching it all day, something like that, they seem to care about that. And have you had a similar experience? Because I found that very striking. Yes, well, I know it's it's the case as well. Yes, indeed. But um, well, they argue that they are working with the raw nanomaterial, so it's like uh, I mean, the comparison may be unfortunate, but. It's like if you would work with asbestos um, that you could breathe and inhale, inhale, whereas they consider that once the nanoproducts uh, are put into consumers' products, they are um, enabled, I mean, in a cream or in a, uh, in a paint or something like that. Well, it's in the products, and so they are uh, not supposed to harm people who are uh, using it. But uh, I agree with you, it's a striking issue. Just quickly, I actually picked up on, on Sean's uh, example as a good illustration. I was thinking a lot, um, uh, Celine, you made, made a comment about, you know, initially about how the scientists, the uh, nanoscientists, aren't interested in talking about ethics. And, and um, it, it, you know, I really, and when we think about upstream approaches to ethics, integrating ethics into research programs, I really think about how do we integrate ethics in the lab. I mean, there's no, you know, if we're going to reject, if we're going to say that values are part of science, then there's no, if it's, the question is, how, or why don't we, how do we, so, uh, why don't we have initiatives like the sort of thinking of the moral architecture argument put by uh, Walker, uh, the feminist philosopher of science or ethicist, I think she is, about um, creating spaces whereby we can actually have scientists engage maybe with other, other relevant stakeholders and almost have like a policy process early on. Because we all, IRBs are a very hostile type of institution to engage with, right? So, David, your idea of you know at building an IRB, well, that you know that's, that's creating that division again. And maybe what we're actually wanting is an integration. These might be really good and necessary. Wait, I'm wondering if you have any responses to that kind of thinking. Well, yes, uh, maybe uh, maybe it was exaggerated to say that uh, uh, all well. 
yeah, yeah. all scientists, well, there are some scientists who do there is care, hostility, yeah. uh, who do care about ethical issues. So mm -hmm. we cannot say uh, that generally nanotechnological scientists don't care about. It. Well, I know there have been some uh, interesting research. I think it's in, in Arizona, but I'm not sure about that. Um, with uh, the uh, some. It was an anthropologist, Christopher Kelty, who was embedded in a lab, nanotechnological lab. And he basically followed um, the whole team during its research uh, process. And he was I mean, hanging around them there, asking questions to make them justify the way they act, the products they, cho they choose, for example. And that seems to me the one appropriate way to um, uh, to address such an issue, and well, that's, I'm trying to develop something like that in in my university, but well, it's not. People are not eager yet to <laughs> to let the doors of the lab open. But I think it's a it's a that would be one one good way to to be able to address these issues from the earliest stages. Now, in the case of geoengineering. Uh, there are people pushing exactly this line. Um, Nancy Twana and other people at Penn State, in particular, have been uh, there's a paper coming up this year, um, pushing for integrated ethical and scientific uh, analysis in the course of doing the research. So she says we can't do the scientific research first and then start asking the ethical questions because it might be too late, uh, and suggests some ways to integrate the two. Uh, it, the suggestion gets enough attention from the sort of geoengineering community that they're invited to uh, publish papers and volumes on this, uh, to give talks at American Geophysical Union on it. Um, but my sense is the reception from the scientists themselves is something like, that's a good idea, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> but other people probably should. I think we have time for one last question. I was curious, you mentioned that uh, uh, we're talking about the difficulty of defining nanoparticles in terms of size and so on. I mentioned that this could be a challenge for labeling, and it could also be, if I understood correctly, a challenge for applying the precautionary principle. And I was just curious, um, when you mentioned that, I thought, so I could picture somebody saying, well, actually, the precautionary principle can be helpful here because, you know, say we've got some uncertainty about, you know, whether it's, say, around 30 nanometers that most of the, uh, you know, interesting novel properties arise less than that, or 100 nanometers or a little bit bigger. Well, we'll be precautionary and just say anything up to 500 nanometers or something like that, we'll label. So I'm just curious what your thoughts would be on that idea that precautionary principle could actually help us in addressing this difficulty with labeling because we could just be you know, as inclusive as possible in order to sort of be precautionary and so on. Yes, well, the fact is that currently the limit is 100 nanometer, which is problematic because in fact 100 nanometer, well, it is, a, uh, sorry, how, how would I say? Well, for, for some materials, there are, um, a, a threshold below which the properties start changing. But for other non uh, materials, the, the, the change of properties is gradual. So 100 nanometers is, well, would not allow to encompass every uh, material. Uh, Do you think there could be a, a higher threshold that would work pretty well, or is it just too difficult to grab? Well, that would maybe Maybe we could take a higher threshold, but I, I don't think it would solve every problem because it would solve maybe the question of the size, but it will the, 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 the question of uh, other physical features would, would not be addressed that way. And so it's maybe a partial answer, but <laughs> I think our time is up. So thank you very much, everybody.